Hello. So we've done a couple of things in this prototype. One of the things we've done is when we press this button, there's a second delay, and then there's 10 seconds of fire. If this was a real space mission, uh, that wouldn't be 10 seconds of fire. That would be like hours of fire, and then days of floating around the Earth randomly. So if we are going to make your player wait through that in real time, there are some things they'd prefer to do rather than play your game, like drive ice picks up their toenails. So we're going to let the player control the speed at which time passes, so they can fast forward to wherever makes them feel comfortable in terms of how many missions they've got running and whether there's something coming up. The first thing we need to do is create a global time controller, something where the entire universe moves at the same rate. Here it is, the universe class. We're just going to stick that on the main camera for now. This will be a class that everyone else references. So if you've got like a rocket engine, it'll say, well, how fast am I supposed to be simulating this? It'll ask the universe, and the universe will say, okay. But the big thing that the universe does is it actually understands when the player wants to change how fast things are moving. Let's do this Kerbal style. When you press period, time will accelerate, and when you press comma, time will decelerate. One way to do that is to use if input key, uh, uh, key down, keycode.period. This would be one way to do it. But that doesn't let the player remap anything. You're stuck using period and comma even if you have a non-local keyboard or if you'd like to have them attached to something else. Just because I'm used to Kerbal controls doesn't mean the universe needs to be. So what we're going to do is we're going to use Unity's built-in contr uh, uh, input controller system. And that will let people change whatever they need to change. So here we are. And we're just going to add one more axis. And we're going to call it timescale. And the negative button will be comma, the positive button will be period, there will be no alt positive button. There we go. We have now created an input axis called timescale. Timescale. And that will allow us to, um, to get that input from period and comma by default. But if the player wants to change it, they can do that. Uh, however, for some reason, Unity uses the phrase time scale with a capital S. So just to stay in tune with Unity, we're going to capitalize that S even though it's nonsense. So this is the axis we've just added. So over here we can say if input dot get axis time scale is greater than zero, then we can increase the time. Uh, well, it turns out that time, the class that Unity uses to do this, actually has a timescale object. Come on. There it is, timescale. We could multiply it by two. And then we could debug.log timescale is now time.timescale. Will this work? Well, if you've done this before, you've already spotted the problem, but let's go ahead and give it a shot. All right, so let's accelerate. Oh, look, an error. Time scale is 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. Oh my gosh, an error. What happened? I only pressed period once. Well, this is an axis, so once you press period, it shoots up to being full 1 or full negative 1 and stays there until you let go of the button. That means that every frame, we're going to be multiplying the time scale by 2, which is ludicrous. The good news is that these axes are also buttons. So we can say input.getButton down time scale. And now we're going to restart this. Oh, look, much nicer. We still get the bug about going over 100, though. Unity's built-in timescale system doesn't go above 100 times standard speed, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, one of those reasons is because physics gets really obnoxious to try and simulate, so you'll lose a lot of frames. Um, also, the other problem with this method is, I'll show you right now, if we accelerate to 64 times speed, everything gets changed. So we have a problem where we're having a hard time controlling things because everything is moving faster. Um, now you can go in and you can divide that by the time scale and that sort of stuff, but once it gets over 100, those divisions start to get really bad and they start to really affect how your game plays. Another problem with going above 100 is that this method here 
Uh, let's cut it up to 64 here. This method here also modifies the speed of every animation in particle system. So if you have a particle system that has a maximum, has like a thousand particles a second being spawned, like we do here, well, if you're running at a hundred times the speed, you're spawning a hundred thousand particles uh, per second. So you've just added a hundred times the amount of taxing computations onto your system. For that reason, this method won't work for us. Uh, this system here, we need to go way, way above 100 times speed. We need to let the player be at a million or a billion times standard speed. So, to that end, we can't use this time.timescale method. You might be able to in your application. If you do choose to use the time.timescale method, keep in mind that when you fast forward or, or slow down, everything fast forwards and slows down. All of the animations and particle effects all of that moves faster uh, or slows down. Um, and so you're going to have to divide by time scale in any situation where you are moving a camera because otherwise your camera will freak out. Player input needs to all be divided by time scale. Um, we're not going to have to worry about that though because we can't use this method. I can't use time.timescale. By the way, if we wanted to complete this, we would just say else. There we are. Put in some code to check whether you're going over 100 or whatever. But we can't use this. We need to do something else. So we're going to add a new variable. Public static int timescale equals 1. We don't want the player to be able to scale to less than 1. And we don't want any floating point errors due to the player scaling to a billion. So we're going to use an integer. And here we're going to say timescale and timescale. We're going to go ahead and say if, else if, timescale is greater than 1, because we don't want to try and divide by 2 if it's 1. So when we go back here and we hit play and we accelerate, timescale is now 1. What's up with that? What did I do wrong? Um, oh. There we are. And you can see that now we're running at 8 million times the speed that we were, at least in theory. In practice, nothing has changed. We have still got the exact same responses everywhere. See? That's definitely not running 8 million times faster. So how do we make that run 8 million times faster? Well, I'm going to show you and I'm going to teach you some of the annoyances that come with uh, time scales and time manipulation like this. And this is why Unity has packaged it up using the time.timescale system so that you don't have to worry about the stuff I'm about to show you. If you don't care how about how, how to do this, that time scale thing I showed you before, if that's all you need, just use that and you can stop watching now. Unfortunately, I need to be a lot more aggressive. The first step is to change this event handler so that it divides by universe.timescale. Now what this will do is this will wait for a shorter amount of time the higher the timescale is. And that means that if I hit play here, if we were to accelerate to 60, 128 times and hit the button, there you go. So the joy here is that we're not multiplying the animations or the particle effects. We're just changing the amount of time they run for. So we don't have the massive computer taxing 10 billion particles per second problem that you get when you accelerate the time uh, using the built-in system. So even though we only have a couple of seconds of fire, it's not all of the fire compressed into those couple of seconds. It's just the same amount of fire that would normally be happening per second for a shorter number of seconds. And that means that we can run uh, at any speed without screwing up our computer. But there is a problem with this. If we go down to time scale of 1 and we hit play here, we're going at 32,000 times speed, but the rocket exhaust is still running at 1 times speed. So that means that if we're going to do it this way, we can't use the wait for seconds method because the wait for seconds method sort of assumes that you're um, not going to change the nature of a second. It does actually react properly, as far as I can tell, to the time.timescale method, but we're not using the time.timescale method, we're using this method here. Uh, I don't believe that time has any... 
No. Just checking to see whether or not they had any kind of time interrupt system. So this yield return new wait for seconds, this is not going to work because we are now able to change the amount of seconds that it actually needs to wait while it's waiting, and that's going to screw this up. So we do need to implement the uh, the more robust but also more annoying method, which is public float time elapsed equals zero, and public int uh, event index equals zero, uh, and protected bool um, playing. So down here in start executing, instead of having a coroutine, we are going to say playing equals true, event index equals zero, time elapsed equals zero. We're also going to go ahead and say if playing equals true, debug.log already playing and return, just so that we can't screw this up by playing through multiple times. And we no longer need this run events system. We're just going to comment it out for now. Here in update, we're going to say if playing equals true, there's some code we need to execute. So we're going to say time elapsed plus equals time dot delta time divided by universe, oh, sorry, times universe dot time scale. And this is the same thing you would do if uh, if you hadn't been taught this IE enumerator method. This is the standard way to do these kind of event chains. It's flabby though, so you only need to do it when the standard model won't work, because this is a lot more annoying and flabby. If time elapsed is greater than events um, event index dot uh, delay time elapsed minus equals events event events event index dot delay and event event index dot action dot um, what is it trigger invoke event index plus plus if event index is greater than or equal to um, events.count then playing equals false so let me go over this real quick First off, we're checking whether the event index is invalid. If the event index is invalid, then we need to stop playing. The reason that it's up here instead of in here is because we may have no events. It may be that if our event index is zero, uh, then we can still have a, an error. So if our count is zero and our event index is zero, no play, stop playing. Otherwise, it's mostly just to stop playing when you hit the end of the list of events. We could put a check. A chick. We could put a check in here to make sure that we don't bother to execute if we don't have any events. But the thing is that there are a lot of situations where we might be changing which events are in the queue really, really fast, and at times where we can't predict exactly when that'll happen. So it's better to error out at the last second rather than error out too early and uh, and force uh, the situation to become confused depending on which scripts execute first. Uh, don't want to worry about that shit. So we'll do it at the last second right here. We then add to our time elapsed the amount of actual time elapsed multiplied by the time scale that we're currently using. Then we say that, well, if that's more than enough time, we want to subtract our, uh, our the amount of time that passed. And then we invoke the action and then we increase the events index. Now we're doing time elapsed minus equals events in de invent index dot delay because there's if we're at a million times the standard speed and something's only supposed to take one second, we don't want to take we don't we don't want to add in a million seconds and then lose nine hundred and ninety nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine of those seconds. So we just subtract our delay. Now one of the tricks here, this is not enough because we'll still have those nine hundred and ninety nine seconds that we will need to do something with. We will actually need to finish off those 999 seconds. Because of that, uh, what we need to do in this case is we actually need to update again. 
but we don't need to update again like this because we do not want to add in this time.delta time stuff. How are we going to do this? Oh my gosh. Well, this is a situation where a function comes in handy. Um, uh, boop, boop. All right, so I've just changed the way that this works. And what we have now is we've got, if we're playing, then add the amount of time we need to our time elapsed, and then check the time elapsed. Here in time elapsed, we never add any more time, but we do continue to execute events uh, until we run out of time or events. It should work fine. Let's go ahead and take a look back here. First, we'll just make sure that it works in the standard method. Yep, seems to work fine. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this rocket to have a much, much longer firing, uh, firing method. Right now it fires for 10 seconds. Let's go ahead and make it fire for just an, a huge, annoying amount of time, like a thousand seconds, okay? So now when I hit play, and I hit the button, this is going to happen for a thousand seconds. That's obviously not something we want to wait through. Well, what do we do? We can start to accelerate time. See? It's going so fast that it's actually turning itself off before you even see the rocket exhaust. There. Just one little particle. And that's a side effect of us moving faster than the particle system. And that's actually what I want, because it keeps the load on the computer reasonable and I'm not using any physics events or anything like that, so this will all work fine. And that is the annoyance of having to deal with particle oh, sorry, with time scales. Uh, if you can use the time, dot time scale system, that's a lot easier. If you have to build your own, you're going to have to keep in mind that um, the player is going to want to change that time scale in the middle of an event. Also, uh, you're going to have to be careful in code because it's possible that you might have a script that will change the timescale event. For example, if we hit this and we wanted it to actually pause when it's done, well, we would need to be careful because if that happens in the middle of a frame, what will happen is the first 12 or whatever missions that are having things running, they'll execute at a million times uh, speed. And then you'll hit the fifth one or the 13th one and it'll say, wait, pause, go slow, and then every the next 12 missions will happen at normal speed, and you'll end up with a bevy of missions at the front that are thousands of seconds ahead and don't realize it. So because of that, what you actually need to do is you need to make sure that this time scale system cannot be changed except at the beginning of a frame. And the way to do that is to go here into the time scale uh, universe here, We've got this public static int timescale. What we actually want to do is have a protected static int timescale with an underscore. And then here we want to use get return timescale and set. We don't want to say timescale equals value. If we do this, then that means that whenever we're setting it, this is when it's getting set. Instead what we want to do is we want to have a um, protected static int target timescale equals one. So instead what we say is target timescale equals value. So what we're saying is if someone tries to set the timescale, don't set the timescale. Just set the target timescale. Okay? Easy enough, right? No problem. Down here in update, what we're going to do is we're going to say uh, if if target timescale does not equal timescale, then timescale equals target timescale. We don't have to put this into that framework because it's already going to be in that framework. 
but we do have to realize that what I've done is backwards. Because what happens here is I'm saying, okay, well, if the target timescale is different, then change the timescale. And then here I'm saying, okay, set the target timescale to be something different. So obviously, we want to do these in the opposite order, or alternately, we can just put underscores here. Um, it's up to you which way you prefer. Uh, there are a lot of things that can go wrong with this, and it really depends on what your preferences are. But there is one more step that we need to take here. Right now, this update gets run whenever. We don't want that. We want this update to always run first. It needs to run before any other update, because that way the time scale will always be set before the slew of other things that want to change the time scale. To do that, what we need to do is go into Edit, Project Settings, Script Execution Order, and what we would like to do is we would like to make our universe execute first. Easy enough, right? Now I realize that this was probably um, code that many people will never need and maybe uh, maybe beginners aren't interested in this kind of juggling um, but I had to do it and I figured well I'll record it maybe someone will find some value in this tutorial thanks for sticking around